we've talked a little bit about lay of the land, what is FOIA, let's talk about some nuts and bolts. And I'll teach you a little bit about how to do FOIA requests and give you the benefit of some of our experience dealing with a lot of requests and learning particular things that may be helpful to ask for, particular ways to draft requests to get at what you're looking for. First, you want to find the right place and person to send your request to. You want to think about what public body or maybe multiple public bodies would have the kinds of documents that you're looking for. Then you want to find out how to go about doing a FOIA request to them, write your request, and follow up. So first, finding the right place and person. You're going to want to find the FOIA officer for the public body. Using the internet is obviously a very helpful way to try to find that information. Many public bodies have a link at the bottom or on one of the sides of their front page called FOIA. And if you click on that, you can find their procedures as to where to send a request and who to address it to. If you need to, you can always call a main phone number. And if none of these work, you can always send your request to the head of the public body, to the mayor, to the president of the board, or something. Then you want to write your request. There's no specific format required, but you do need to put your request in writing. A public body can elect to respond to an oral request, but it doesn't have to, and best practice is always to put your request in writing so it's clearly documented what you've asked for and when you asked for it. You're going to want to include your name and your contact information. If that presents issues, you may be able to send your request from an anonymous email address. You can send your request in person, or by mail, fax, or email. And I've underlined fax or email because I strongly recommend that you consider sending it by fax or email, which will provide you with a confirmation receipt and an exact date and time in which the request was received, which may become important if your request is denied or if you're not receiving a response. You do not need to use a standard form from a public body in sending a request. Many public bodies have such forms, and you can elect to use one if you'd like, but you're not required to do so send an email that simply says, under FOIA, I'm requesting the following things, or a fax or a letter to the same effect. Generally speaking, if the form simply asks for your contact information, what you're requesting, and some boxes to check regarding commercial purpose, or whether you're requesting a fee waiver, then you may wish to use the form, although you're not required to do so. However, if the form asks for information that makes you uncomfortable, for example, if it asks you to certify under penalty of perjury, that you are not submitting your request for the purposes of harassing the government, which is something I have seen in forms from various public bodies in the past, or if it's asking for the purpose of your request beyond the scope of what's needed to determine whether you're requesting for a commercial purpose or to determine whether you're entitled to a fee waiver, then I would advise you not to, not to use the standard form, but instead to simply make your request by email saying, under FOIA, I request the Let's talk now a little bit about some tips, ideas, practice pointers, and how to draft your request. If you're not familiar with the process or don't have a lot of experience in drafting a FOIA request, it can be a little bit of an art form or counterintuitive in translating whatever the issue is that you're concerned about into actual requests for documents that would be subject to FOIA and will get you what it is that you're looking for. So I'm going to provide you just some options in different ways you may or may not want to go about drafting your request. Uh, depending on what the issue is and what it is you're looking for. One method is a more general request. If, if there's something about a decision made in a particular TIF property, for example, you could request all documents related to the TIF property located at blank, whatever the address is. Now that may require narrowing depending on what the volume of documents are. You can also make a more specific request. For example, the contract between the village and the subcontractor. You can try a parameter-based request. All of the mayor's emails sent to receive the second week of August 2011. And you could add containing the word blank. In the modern age of email communications, most email systems will allow for a search that would allow someone to set those date parameters and search for the keyword you've selected and generate a list of documents that would be responsive. Again, this may require narrowing depending on what volume uh, of documents are involved. And throughout, Exemptions may apply as well, especially emails. Some of those emails may be exempt, others may not. That'll be an individual document-by-document document analysis that the public body will have to undertake. But this can be a way to try to get at whatever the issue is. For example, if you knew that a decision was being made in the second week of August 
2011 about something that's important to you, then this may be a way to try to get at those documents that are related to that decision. Another issue that comes up a lot is questions. A public body is not required to create any documents that don't already exist, and it's not required to answer your questions. But there are ways that you can take a question and convert it into a potential viable FOIA request. For example, all you need to do is take your question and proceed it with the words documents sufficient to show. For example, if you'd like to know how many police cars your police department owns, and you send a letter that says, please tell me how many police cars do you own, or ask the question, how many police cars do you own, it will probably draw a denial. But if you replace that with the request for documents sufficient to show how many police cars the village maintains, then that's a valid FOIA request that should draw a response. Policies and procedures are a very commonly overlooked area to request. Whatever the issue is that you're concerned about, whether it's approval for some decision or a process or pretty much anything, I always find it helpful to include with your request whatever policies and procedures relate to whatever that subject matter is. And that will allow you to get a better sense of what other documents you may want to ask for. A policy and procedure document might indicate a particular approval form or what people are involved in their approval. And those can be very useful clues to following up with additional requests to get at exactly what it is you're looking for. I also, as I had mentioned earlier, I like to include the index and immediate release list that we talked about early on is some of the things that are required to be maintained under FOIA. Those can be very helpful tools in getting at the documents you're looking for. And you really need to think beyond what the underlying issue is and get at what types of documents might have what you want. And that will depend from request to request, but you always want to take a second and think a little more broadly than just your question and try to think about what kind of documents there may be that would have the kind of information you're looking for. Finally, if you're asked to narrow a request that has been deemed unduly burdensome by a public body, seek specific information from the public body about the types of documents that are available so that you can make an informed decision on how to narrow your request. So after you've made your request, it's very important that you track it and follow up. A public body must respond within five business days, unless you're a recurring requester, which we'll discuss in a moment, or a commercial purpose for your request, in which case more time is needed. The public body can extend the time to respond by up to no more than five additional business days under certain circumstances that pertain to such things as records located in multiple locations, the need for an extensive search, undue burden on the public body or interference with its business, or review by additional personnel and other such things. And the statute specifies the specific and exclusive grounds that permit the public body to extend the response time by five additional days. If you don't receive a response within five days, that's treated under the law as effectively a denial. And we'll talk in a little bit about what you can do if you've been denied. It's very important that you keep everything. Keep your copy of your request, any responses, any other communications. If you end up getting a call from a public body or make a call to a public body, you want to at least make notes of your call with, your, with the date on it. I also suggest to people you may want to consider sending a follow-up email after a conversation that says, as we just discussed, I've agreed to grant you an additional five days or 10 days or two weeks or whatever you've agreed to to respond to my request, or I've agreed to narrow it in a particular way. Make sure you document that with a follow-up letter or email so you have a written record of exactly what was agreed to. Now, I mentioned a recurring requester. This is a recent addition to the statute. It applies to a requester who's made, in the past 12 months, either 50 total requests within the 12 months, 15 requests in any 30-day period within those 12 months, or seven requests in one week within those past 12 months. One request may identify multiple records without turning it into multiple requests, which can be important in totaling how many requests you've actually and this does not apply to requests that are made by news media and nonprofit, scientific, or academic organizations when the principal purpose of the request is news, public interest, research, education, etc. So, what happens if I'm labeled a recurring requester? Well, first, you may want to ask the public body to document exactly which requests they're using to calculate you as a recurring requester. And in making your request over a particular period of time, you'll want to 
think about how a recurring requester gets calculated, especially seven requests in one week. You may want to think about spreading that out over an eight or ten day period instead of a seven day period so that you don't draw seven requests in one week. Similarly, 15 requests in any 30 day period. You might want to break that up a little bit if you can in order to keep from being uh, deemed a recurring requester. Now, if you are deemed a recurring requester, here's how it works. Within five days, the same five days as any other response, the public body has to respond to you. In, within, in, in that response, has to assert the recurring requester rule and the basis for that. That then gives the public body 21 days to respond to the merits of your request, in other words, whether it will grant or deny the request, and to provide you with an estimated time to provide the records to you. And that time must be a reasonable period of time considering the size and complexity of the request. Within that reasonable time period, the public body must provide the records to you. What will be deemed a reasonable period of time has not been litigated yet, um, so we'll have to see what happens there, but that does have to take into account the size and complexity of the request. If you've made a request for last year's budget and it takes a public body a month or two to respond, you would likely have a very strong argument that considering the size and complexity of the request, which is small and very simple, a one to two month period of time is not at all. 